A hundred year old Maltese woman has shared her secret behind her long life. St. Julian's is mayor has warned against, the co against commercial trash not being collected in Parcherville. A top lawyer has called for the removal of life sentences on drug trafficking cases. All this and more on today's episode of Love and Daily. Good evening, Malta Gozo, and welcome to the final edition of Love and Daily. Uh, I'm Tim Diakono, joined by Julian Bonici. And yes, this is the last time we're going to be presenting Love and Daily. It, we've, been, we've been presenting it for over um, 500 days since, since, the, uh, since early 2020. We've seen through a lot the start of the pandemic, the continuation of it. Um, We've had several great hosts along the way. We've interviewed several um, top top guests on um, live live in our studio. And in fact, we're going to be having the last of these today. And that is uh, mega athlete Nila Juice, who will be who will be speaking to us about about his latest ventures. So from my end, before we begin, it's been um, it's been a pleasure to to be with you um, throughout, throughout, throughout this journey. Uh, and this may be the end for Love and Daily, but there are uh, other, other plans um, in, in the pipeline and they will be, they will be coming out um, shortly. So uh, let's, with that, with that under the way, Ju, um, 100 year old Maltese woman has spoken out giving her secrets on, on long life, what are they? Yeah, you know, and I think there's no better way, you know, once to start over after 500 episodes, you know, together, we're closing a chapter, you know, but preparing to open a new one. And then there's no better way to start, I think, by hearing some really good life lessons from a Maltese woman who's just turned 100 years old. Edith Malia, two people of Malta, share the secret behind her long life. And it might not necessarily what you think, but it's actually a shot of whiskey every morning. In Edith's words, she said, you know, I'm a hundred, a hundred years and one month old. The secret, a tot of whiskey in the morning. I get up, shower, have breakfast, one tot of whiskey, no medicine and off to work, she said. She said they actually got it from when she was young, um, she, when she was living in her shop. And a lot of English people used to go by sort of getting her um, into, this, into, into this habit. The secret of long life appears to be sort of uh, in her genes. Her father also passed away at 100 and and two and just like hey you know sort of never took medicines you know and basically worked you know a pretty normal life you know she said herself you know most of my my life i was working for 60 years in a quite a famous uh, clothes shop um, in fgura you know sort of saying how her husband encouraged her all, all the way how what a special marriage they had and sort of how that helped her you know going forward in life she said, you know, that while she sort of never had many friends, you know, she always had her family around her and was happy to have the comfort um, within them. She said, you know, she has three children. She's a grandmother. She's a great grandmother telling people out there, you know, the advice I give is to prioritize your family, your families and friends are secondary. She sort of said she used to do everything, you know, she sewed, knits, um, cooks does everything she needs to sort of keep her brain active um, and moving. Even nowadays, she's at Simbly a care home. She's been there for nearly four years, but she still makes the habit to socialize with everyone and sort of sharing the happiness together to sort of continue going in life. A really, really sweet story. You can read everything she sort of said on loveandmortar.com. If you have any tips for living a long life, let us know uh, in the comments below, Tim. So there you have it. If, you, if, you, if you'd like to live to 100 years old, the full century, then perhaps those are uh, valid tips to follow. St. El St. Julian's is mayor, Alba Buttigieg, has po posted a photo showing how um, large amounts of commercial waste are being um, left uh, on the streets of, of Parcheville um, quite, quite regularly. Now, his argument is that, um, probably not, mo not many people know this, but there's a difference between residential waste and commercial waste, and while the local councils are in charge of, of coordinating the, um, the the picking up of comer of residential waste. When it comes to waste that is thrown away from hotels, from uh, restaurants, and from businesses, they are obliged to 
to um, contract a contractor to pick up the waste. So if um, they are just leaving waste outside and so being picked up, there's something is wrong and it's not the responsibility of the council but of the business. And you, this, this particular photo was taken in the very centre of Pargeville with a, a top hotel, actually more than one, in very, very close proximity. So you can imagine, I mean, even when we talk about, um, I don't like the word, but quality tourism, you're talking about people walking uh, in, in, in the streets, tourists, and you're seeing all this rubbish. It's not really the right outside your hotel. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the, the scene you'd like to see. It's not only for tourists, also for, for, for residents as well. And it's asking um, a very valid question. Why is the law just not being enforced? People are just throwing rubbish outside and nothing ever happens. Yeah, no, and I think it's just another, you know, sign of Malta's very worrying litter and, and waste problem, right? I think you sort of touched on the head, you know, it's not, it's unsightly, you know, for both residents and tourists visiting the locality, you know, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, it rings to this sense of us wanting to have more pride in our communities, right? You know, we should really do our utmost effort to make sure there's not rubbish on the streets, have an eff effective waste management, and not end up scenarios like where Tim is saying, you know, a tourist can wake up or even a resident and finding rubbish sort of everywhere not being cleaned up. More certainly needs to be done about it. On to our next topic. So drug trafficking in Malta currently carries with it a potential life sentence. And one top criminal lawyer believes that the threat of going to prison until death really is leading to a pileup of cases from people determined to fight lifetime incarceration. Um, on social media, lawyer Franco de Bono said, you know, now that cannabis is legal in Malta, does it make sense that, can that traffickers can be imprisoned for a life, for up to a lifetime? He said, even when cannabis was illegal, the punishment was much harder than that of many countries, but now it's created an almost ridiculous uh, situation. He sort of said, you know, does it make sense that for someone trafficking what is at the end of the day a law-abiding substance to be sentenced to life imprisonment? He said, basically, this is why cases last longer, because the penalties are much harsher. Just to explain a bit, you know, a drug trafficker could potentially face life in prison. In Malta, life means until death, and you'll do anything you can, tooth and nail, to sort of fight it rather than maybe getting a potentially reduced sentence. Now, obviously, this comes just as Malta's Justice Ministry is set to announce some reforms to what is admittedly an abysmal, abysmal court system, which has some of the longest delays in Europe. Just to give some context over there, there are about 1,400 pending magisterial inquiries, about 80 jury trials, you know, some of which go back decades. And basically, um, Jonathan Artato actually said in an interview with Love in Malta that he's sort of going to impose legal time frames, you know. Meanwhile, Times of Malta has quoted sources stating, you know, that there could be a one-year limit on pre-trial proceedings and even in the revenue process. Now, De Bono sort of has already sort of rubbished these proposals, saying they would solve nothing and actually saying, you know, the bulk of the cases actually involve uh, drug uh, trafficking. And interestingly enough, on a side note, Malta already has the, the time-imposed limits, right, for these things. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, extensions have become the rule rather than the exception. Uh, I don't know about you, Tim. For yeah. me, obviously, there's a bit of a, a debate over here to have around drug trafficking. But yeah, you know, I mean, trafficking is not, I mean, not obviously a, a good thing to do, but to be sentenced to until effectively potential up until death, uh, I don't know. I think it's something we really need to revisit, particularly yeah. when we're saying about reforming our drug rules. Yeah, I mean, it's not so big secret that the majority of prisoners, the vast majority, are there for drug drug offences. Uh, I mean, when you say life imprisonment, that's the maximum sentence. Not, I don't, I don't think anyone no. ever gets life, but it's there, right? The, the possibility is looming, and that means the lawyers must uh, must fight to, to more tooth and nail. And yeah, that means cases can drag out and uh, and take up time of, of certain magistrates. So, so yes, I do see as a valid point. I mean, the, the issue I see is one of of putting things into perspective, of uh, of saying okay, there's a crime and there's a and then there's a crime. Like let's not forget, uh, recently there was a there was a, a man who killed his mother and daughter and sister in cold blood intentionally and got sentenced to 35 years. And it's not that old, so he probably will see life outside of a prison cell. So when we put that into perspective, is that a worse crime than trafficking drugs? I think so. I de I definitely think so. So it probably could be time to. 
to to update the laws, especially since, as he pointed out, uh, so many of our drug laws have been relaxed in in recent years, not only for mm -hmm. cannabis, but also for 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 pills, for cocaine, mm -hmm. as a small amounts for small possessions. Um, meanwhile, the, uh, the Nationalist Party's the Nationalist, Nationalist Party's deputy leader Dave Dajus has underlined the difficulty facing the the PNMPs on the Public Accounts Committee when it comes to investigating the electric gas contract by bringing out a copy of the actual contract during a, a, an interview on Net TV to drive home just how hefty it is. And, uh, I, I, and I think he makes a, a very valid point, isn't really spoken about often, in that this is an extremely you know, everyone talks a lot about this electric gas contract, um, but this is an extremely technical report written by, by engineers, lawyers, and uh, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of finance involved. And um, there are three uh, opposition MPs. Well, there should be four government MPs joining them as well, to be fair, but, but somehow so far they haven't, um, they haven't questioned uh, or the, the, the contents of the deal much. Um, and they have to first read this report, understand it, find the questions related to it, um, and, uh, and, and then ask them and know when the witnesses in front of them aren't telling the truth. And it's very difficult for, and they, this they must do during their free, or during their free time, because they have full-time jobs, they have parliamentary duties, party duties, constituent stuff. And meanwhile, there has this massive technical report that's extremely in the national interest for the truth to, to, to emerge from it. And yeah, it's very difficult and there is something wrong, I feel. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. you know, there's definitely something you know, wrong, wrong in the system. And you have to remember, you know, these, these MPs, particularly um, backbench MPs, non-cabinet members, are all doing this part-time, you know what I mean? They have jobs to maintain, uh, families to maintain, and all this stuff, and really don't have the time to devote themselves to such an important uh, report. At the end of the day, what worries me is, you know, in the PAC, rather than seeing all of the MPs, PN or PL, you know, come together to really safeguard, you know, what's important in the community, Rather, you know, you see them sort of engaging in quite petty bickering, you know, on what is, like you said, you know, such a crucial, crucial, crucial report uh, on the, the country. On to our next, uh, the last story uh, on Love and Daily, and I think there's no better way to cap it off than celebrating, you know, Maltese talent, you know, here and abroad. To close off, uh, Maltese 19-year-old tennis sensation Francesca Curmi has cemented her place at an ITF tournament in Spain, making it all the way to the single semi-final and the doubles final following two impressive performances today. She zeroed on, she zeroed on in the, on the single semi-final after getting the better of the tournament's number one seed, that's Spain, Sevilla, Sevilla. You know, Ruiz, the highest ranked player in the entire competition. After losing the first set 6-3, Kurmi managed an emphatic comeback, winning the next two sets 6-love and 7-6. Her stunning vein of form didn't end there. Together with Serbian partner Mikela Djakovic, the two faced off against another Spanish pairing in the semi-final, winning 6-2, 6-3. This means, you know, that Francesca Corm is going to play in the doubles final over the weekend and will also be playing in a semi-final tomorrow. So make sure uh, you tune in this weekend to see if she goes all, all, all the way. Now, before we cut to our interview with Neil Arjus, uh, I just wanted to say something very small to close up what's been an incredible two years uh, for the show. It's been a real fun ride co covering all the latest news from the island, be it political, social, artistic or environmental. It really, really, truly was a joy see speaking about all these stories first. Hand. We brought on some incredible guests who, uh, who, see, who never, were never afraid of offering um, some hot takes you know, on the biggest issues in the country. As Tim said earlier, we worked through a pandemic and sometimes seemingly never-ending news cycles. But really and truly, it's been an honor to do so for our dedicated viewers out there. And of course, the amazing team members that made this all possible, particularly the people behind the camera who you've never been able to see but have done an amazing job no matter what's been put on them. Thank you for watching along the way. And as always, have an evening full of oven. You'll be seeing us all very, very soon.
That's the last episode of Love and Daily, actually. Hello everyone for the last episode of Love and Daily ever. We're here with record-breaking ultra-endurance swimmer and well-known activist Nila Jews right ahead of this weekend's Ocean Festival happening this Saturday, 28th May. So Neil, everyone out there, let us know what is this Ocean Festival all about? <laughs> so Ocean Festival is pretty much a concept I've been kind of curating for the last uh, three years and it's pretty much what I do with my ultra distance swimming, so which is like kind of testing your limits, feeding your mindset and really just bringing a community together and putting, giving it to the everyday person. So what we're doing is we're organizing um, swims in the sea so it's going to be finding really unique uh, spots in Malta and Gozo to the swims coupled with an event after so an expo style event where there'll be different sporting brands there'll be some music there'll be some entertainment some games and I think these put these components put together just um, really make up the perfect event and what's happening this weekend for people who don't know yeah so this weekend is the iconic swim from uh, gozo to malta so i would say it's probably one of the coolest channels to swim in i mean once you've done it it's one of those you've done but if you haven't everyone wants to to cross from gozo to malta it's, it's, the myths that it's so deep over there that it's meant to be scary water and whatnot um, but as you, once they swim it they're like oh that was amazing let's let's do another one, let's, let's find the next swim, let's find the next spot to, to kind of find to swim in. So. No, that's uh, for me super brave because I'm uh, terrified of uh, open dark waters. I don't know why, it's just been something I've always had when I was young. What do people, you know, these people swimming, how many people are there? How did they sort of come to sort of join the swim with you, this sort of festival? This yeah, weekend? so most of them are my clients um, from the adults classes that I give, the fitness classes. And the first one is going to be quite limited, so we'll only have 70 people, which is still an amazing number, to be fair. But um, we haven't really advertised it. We kept it close knit because we really want everything to go really well for the future plans that we, we have. Um, they've been training really hard, working really hard. Um, we already had Luke and Joe who swam last week, and they were like, listen, we trained like the program was really good. They actually found it easy. And <laughs> so whenever you want, Joe, you're more than welcome to jump on board. <laughs> yeah, maybe next year I'll be doing the crossing as well. <laughs> yes, Crying, no doubt, looking at dark water, but I'll, I'll do it for, for sure. Like uh, Quickly, this about the dark water. Realistically, whether it's at two kilometers deep or 40 kilometers deep, it's pretty much the same thing because you're not going to be able to see the bottom. So you're in the same thing. So like, if you manage to do 40 meters and it's dark, then you can swim from Linoza to Malta as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to go further than you. <laughs> um, so I'll coach you, I'll okay, coach you. <laughs> Passing on the time. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, um, for people out there, you know, who want to come watch, you know, who want to come take part in it, but maybe aren't doing the swim, where can they come, you know, what can they do? Yeah, so, obviously the participants, the swimmers are going to have an early start. We're going to meet in Marfa at 5.30 in the morning, and then we're going to get a boat to Gozo, to Hondo, and then they will swim back, and they'll start arriving around 9.30 till about 10.30 is when the action will be happening for the swimmers to be arriving. So it will be cool to come down and check them out. So you'll get, get your kids as well, see them get inspired by other people doing these kind of feats. No, it's, it's, it's really, really amazing. So one thing you know, I've always found really amazing about your campaigns, there's always this sort of sense of community, even when you were doing the Malta Gozo swim, the Linoza Malta Gozo swim, um, even though you swam on your own, right? it was always about building this sort of everyone collecting rubbish, everyone collecting waste from the sea and stuff. Why is the sense of, but now sorry, it's taken to a step further, right? You know, you're bringing people onto, yeah. onto the swim. Why is it so important for you, know, this, this really sense of community? Um, I, I really feel that it, it brings so much to, to us as individuals to be part of a community, to be part of something. We always kind of do so many things alone and together we can make something much bigger and much stronger. Um, and uh, obviously on this issue itself, do you think sort of bringing more people on board into what you're doing sort of helps build that change you're looking for? Definitely, because we don't, especially when it comes to wave of change, we're not looking for 100 people to do it perfectly. We're looking for a million to do it imperfectly. It's not easy to be sustainably perfect because we live in today's world. It's, it's not easy. 
Um, it's quite, almost impossible unless you're very dedicated to the to the cause. Um, uh, so it's just like it's okay to fail. It's okay to not do it perfectly. But let's bring everyone together. Let's do it all together as one. No, that's actually quite, uh, quite a, a nice message. So obviously, you've been doing this for quite a, a few years now. You know, um, from when you started till today, have you seen? improvement sort of in the way people sort of are treating the issue um, and how do you think campaigns like yours sort of help in that message? Um, definitely I think we made a lot of people aware of the problem that we have because I think um, even though we we live in it we're so used to seeing the rubbish on the floor we're so used to seeing the, the packets and dirt and and cigarette butts that it's become like um, normal but when we actually started the campaigns and asked people to pick up three pieces and they actually looked down they're like oh wow Okay, there, there is an actual issue over here, but we need to kind of grow from that. We cannot remain in the in the place of just picking up rubbish. We need to change our mindsets. We need to change our behavioral patterns because that is where the big change is going to come. If we just keep picking up after people, you know, I always give the same example that with my mom. If she always laid my bed, then I will never need to lay my bed because she'll do it. And if we keep picking up the plastic after people, nobody is going to bother being a bit more respectful towards the planet. So. We need to get people to fall in love with nature, fall in love, so that means spend time in nature, because once they fall in love with it, they will care for it more. Yeah. If not, it's down the list, and it's themselves, their family, their partners, their kids, and it's down, down the list when we need to bring that up on the list. And I think that's what you do so nice, right? You really put nature sort of at the center of all you do, even swimming from Malta to Algoza to Malta, you know, it's such a beautiful <laughs> crossing, mm. you know, you really get to experience nature in its fullest. With the Ocean Festival, it's just the start, you know, where do you yeah. see it going, you know, uh, what's, what's, what's what you got in mind? Yeah, no, I've, this is like just a kind of taster for the, for the people who wanted to join and also for ourselves to make sure the organization and the planning and logistics goes exactly perfectly, you know, just taking events to the next level. Um, but yeah, we have um, a three-day event planned for the future where we'll be kind of doing different swims. We've got ocean kids coming up as well, so we want to get the children involved as well. So the plans are big and it, they're exciting. We have some really cool places to go and swim in Malta, guys. And we always tend to go to the same, <laughs> like we always tend to go to the same beach and the same bar or the same uh, coffee shop when there's so many cool places like, and I'm going to show them to everyone and everyone's more than welcome to come train, come swim and join in the fun. Wow, that's really amazing. You land yourself now, obviously, Beyond the Ocean Festival, known for your long distance swims. Anything planned individually? <laughs> Anything, you know, going, going ahead in the future? Yes, there is. Um, I mean, this is the first year since 2017 that I haven't done anything. <laughs> So this year is like working on bringing it closer to the people, but obviously that means I'm working hard to plan something um, a little bit wilder than you would expect to be. Let's, let's just leave it at that for now. Uh, thank you so much, Neil, for coming. Thanks everyone out there for following Love and Daily throughout its history uh, on air. Be sure to go to the Ocean Festival this weekend and obviously keep an eye out for everything Neil Ajus has planned coming up. Thank you all for joining and for the last time ever, have an evening full of love and